Hello and welcome back to MTG Burgeoning, your channel for all things magic. In our video for today, we are going to update and upgrade our Rograk, Son of Roga, and Akiri Line Slinger Partner EDH deck, one of the commander decks residing in the Burgeoning Commander Catalog. What's going on, MTGBC? You are the MTG Burgeoning Community. Welcome back to another installment of our Up and Up series. Today, we are going to update and upgrade Rogaki, which is my name for the Rograk, Son of Roga, and Akiri Line Slinger Equipment Matter deck. This is just one of many EDH decks currently residing in the Burgeoning Commander Catalog, a collection of Commander decks that you can see by clicking on the playlist on MTG Burgeoning's I don't know, what would you call that? Page. <laughs> Go to the YouTube page and check out the playlists. There you will find the BCC. Also, you can look in the description below and click the link to tappedout.net where you can see the deck list of this video as it's as the deck list of this deck as it stands right now. All right, so for today, we've got four new equipment going in, four equipments coming out, one creature going in, and one creature going out. That's all to the current 98 of this build. The first equipment's going in, is Strength Testing Hammer. It's one generic mana to cast and three to equip. And whenever an equipped creature attacks, we roll a six-sided die. That creature gets plus X plus zero until end of turn, where X is the result. Then, if it has the greatest power or is tied for greatest power among creatures on the battlefield, we get to draw a card. Now, the purposes of this deck is to strap on Magic's most powerful and effective equipment onto one of each of our two commanders, either Rogak or Akiri. So in a way, we have a dual Voltron deck that just keeps bringing the threat right out of the command zone and linking up with any and all equipment possible on our side of the battlefield. With the idea of having a Voltron-themed deck, it stands to reason that we would have the most we would have the creature with the biggest power on our side of the battlefield. Maybe not necessarily the most powerful creature, but that remains to be seen as well. Check out the 98 of this deck to see exactly what we can slap on to either one or both of our generals. All right, with that being said, so it stands to reason that because we are a Voltron build, that the creature with the greatest power will be one of ours. So for the purposes of strength testing Hammer, as soon as we send one of those creatures into combat, we should benefit by drawing a card. Additionally, the plus one to plus six power boost will just help us to deal that lethal commander damage even more quickly. Strength, te strength testing hammer is one of the newer equipment that should force its way into the builds of any and all Voltron, Voltron decks. All right, with strength testing hammer going in, coming out, it's going to be our Gentum Armor. It's an equipment for six and six to equip. It gives it gives the equipped creature plus six plus six. And whenever it attacks, we can destroy target permanents. This is just a matter of tempo. Because with Strength Testing Hammer, we're going to get cards into our hand, boost the power of our general, whichever creature it is equipped to, and it only has a mana value of one with an equip cost of three. And although we do have many, many ways to kind of circumnavigate the equip costs of our equipment, three is still a lot better than six, and that's after we pay the six into this equipment just to get it onto the battlefield. I find that playing with this deck as much as I have 
having this equipment in my hand makes me not want to cast it because the six mana used is either used to get one or both of our generals out of the command zone or to soup up one or both of our generals with as many equipment as possible. Very rarely, if ever, am I spending six mana to cast this and put it out onto the battlefield where it just gathers dust for a turn before it can get back to my turn so that I can do something with it. So, from more of a proactive standpoint, I want to put cards into my hand and buff up the power of my general. That's why strength testing hammer's going in, and our gentum armor is coming out. All right, equipment number two going in. It is the Reaver Cleaver. Here we have a legendary equipment for two and a red. It's going to give you creature plus one, plus one, and that oh-so-important evasion of trample. But again, it's, we're going to get another benefit, and that is whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player or a planeswalker, we're going to create that many treasure tokens. The equip cost on this is a very manageable three. So what we're getting here is a power boost, a toughness boost. It's modest at plus one, plus one. The trample is huge, particularly because of the additional evasion that we're going to put on to one of our generals. And when we get in for combat damage, and we will because we're going to slide this right over, Rograk himself is a menacing, trampling, first strike goblin, and Akiri also has the first strike. So that, in addition to the trample on the plus one, plus one, if the Reaver Cleaver finds finds its way equipped to either one of our generals, we should have the benefit of creating many, many treasure tokens. All right, so with the Reaver Cleaver going in, it has to take the place of some other equipment already in the 98, and that is going to be Sword of Vengeance. This is a, not one of the Sword of and Ofs. This is just the Sword of Vengeance from Core 2011. This is a costs three to cast. It's three to equip. An equip creature gets plus two, plus zero. First strike, vigilance, trample, and haste. <clears throat> Excuse me, and haste. All of those buffings are very, very good. The one that we may miss the most might be the haste. The plus two... Plus, oh, the First Strike, the Vigilance, and the Trample are all nice. We have a lot of other equipment that can give us that and a little bit more, including what we're putting in with the Reaver Cleaver. The Haste is the one that might be missed the most. That's something that we're going to keep an eye on in future gameplay because we want to make sure if our commanders are coming out of the command zone and into play, can we attack with them immediately so that we don't have them sitting on the battlefield for a full set of turns waiting for one of our opponents to cast some kind of removal, either spot or sorcery speed board wipes. We're going to have to keep an eye on that. So Sword of Vengeance at this time is going to yield to the Reaver Cleaver. And again, if needed, we may have to discuss the Sword of Vengeance's return in a future installment of the Up and Up series. All right, the next equipment going in. It is Thran Power Suit, an equipment with a generic mana cost of two and an equip cost of two. This is going to give equipped creature plus one, plus one for each aura and equipment attached to it. And the equipped creature has Ward 2. Now, Ward, for anyone who's unfamiliar with that newer mechanic, it's kind of like a hexproof, except that the opponent who is trying to target our equipped creature can do so by paying an additional two generic mana for any of their spells or abilities. If not, then, well, that spell or ability is going to fizzle. What this equipment is going to give is a massive power boost, because let's face it, it's going to go on to one of our generals that already has two, three, four, maybe even more equipment placed on it. So it's going to get minimally plus one, plus one for itself. The Ward 2 is going to help protect our generals as well because they're going to be lightning rods for attention because we're trying to win the game through lethal commander damage. That's 21 points and not 40 or more. And with that being said, the additional protection and ward and the boosting is going to help us to deliver that lethal combat damage that much more quickly. All right, so with the Thran Power Suit going in with its plus one, plus one buffing and ward two, an equipment has to come out. 
And although it pains me to do this to break up the set, because this deck originally was crafted with the idea of the flavor of having every single possible sword of and of, I'm sorry, sword of and, you know, the mythic swords, having all of them built around Rograk and Akiri. Well, we're getting to the point now with so many equipment being developed all the time that we're going to have to yield to power over flavor. And with that being said, Thran power suits going in and coming out, uh, sadly, is the sword of body and mind. Now, there's a little bit more to this story than just removing what could be considered the weakest of the seven current mythic swords. What we have here, I'm sorry, eight current mythic swords. I'm sorry, we're up to eight now. We're still waiting on the Selesnia one and the Demir one. We've got the Azorius. We have the um, uh, we have the Rakdos one, and we have the Selesnia one. So we're waiting for Gruul and no, we don't have the Selesnia one. What the heck? Yeah, we have the Selesnia one, the Hearth and Home. All right, getting back here to the task at hand. So, sort of body and mind protection from blue, protection from green, plus two, plus two. Whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, we create a 2-2 wolf, and then that player mills the top 10 cards of their library. It's that last ability right there that had to absolutely sink this card, and I'm going to explain the reason for that right now. So, with the sort of body in mind, there was a recent game I was playing with this deck. I had that bad boy souped up on one of my commanders, I think it was Rograk. And I was just swinging in for commander damage after commander damage and eliminating the first opponent. Then came to the second opponent who was playing a tribal deck. I want to say it might have been dragons or it might have been slivers. Actually, it probably was, it was one of those two. It might have been dragons. So I'm looking at what's going into this guy's graveyard and I'm like, okay, <clears throat> he's trying to fill up the graveyard. Actually, I think it might've been slivers. I can't remember the creature type. It was either dragons or slivers, but either way, what was happening is because of the dealing the combat damage, the 10 cards getting milled into the graveyard was stockpiling the creatures in it. So these slivers or dragons, I can't remember which one, were just becoming more and more problematic. And I know that there was a, a bevy of mass recursion spells that were going to be coming up soon, whether it was going to be a living death or a patriarch's bidding or a rise of the dark realm. Something was coming to get those creatures from the graveyard onto his side of the battlefield to win the game. The problem with that is I only had the one creature on my side of the battlefield. I had Rograk, it had the sword, I was able to attack for commander damage, not enough to kill the person, I needed to swing, I think, two or three more times to kill the player. But if I was going to do that, the cards were going to get milled from their library into their graveyard. I had no other creatures in play to unequip the sword and get it off of Rograk to put it onto someone else so that I can attack with Rograk and not inadvertently fill this other player's library. So it became a war of attrition. I would get a creature onto the battlefield, he would kill it, making Rograk staying on the battlefield and my hands being tied. I couldn't get additional equipment to try to swing in for a one-shot. It became a detriment to the win condition of this deck, and that can never happen again. I had to purposely hold back my attacker because of what it was going to do filling that player's graveyard, which could have cost me the game. So that is why the sword is coming out, and it's going to be replaced by Thran Power Suit. I can never run into that type of scenario again. I had the game, but I couldn't risk what was going to get put into that graveyard because of that mass recursion spell would have won it for him. Duh. <sighs> well, it is what it is. The sword of body and mind is out, and the Thran power suit is in. All right, the fourth and final equipment going into the 98 of this deck. It is two-handed axe. Here we have an adventure. It's an instant, and it's an equipment. So let's talk about sweeping cleave first. We can cast this for its instance for its instant side for one in red and then exile it as it waits to take its other adventure. 
and what we get as target creature we control gains double strike until end of turn. That is a very relevant instant ability that we have in this deck, particularly because we're trying to win with lethal commander damage. If we can jam one of our generals up to a power of an, of an 11, and then cast this, we eliminate an opponent as long as we can swing for that 11 double strike damage. More so, we're looking at here is the equipment side of this spell, which is called, of course, Two-Handed Axe. And we can equip it for one in a red after we cast it for two in a red. And whenever we equip creature attacks, we double its power until end of turn. So we could have the benefit of giving a creature double strike by casting the Sweeping Cleave, then casting the Two-Handed Axe, and then equipping it. I mean, that's seven mana all for two spells and just equipping, casting, and equipping one equipment onto a, one of our generals. That is a possibility. More, more often than not, we're probably just going to cast the Sweeping Cleanse as a combat trick and then bring in the Two-Handed Axe at another time. But being able to double the power of one of our creatures, particularly if it's Rograk with the Menace, and we know our opponents don't have enough creatures to block, that could be considered a potential game-winning synergy because, again, this deck is geared towards winning with lethal commander damage, and if we can double Rograk's power from 11 to 22, and we can swing uncontested, Guess what? We just won the game. We didn't win the game. We just eliminated one of our opponents with lethal commander damage. All right, so the two-handed axe is going in. It's going to take the place of an artifact that I had made a mistake about. Now, this goes all the way back to the time of the original deck tech when we were deck teching this for its entrance into the burgeoning commander catalog. I had made an oversight in thinking that this interaction could work, and now I am correcting that oversight by removing the artifact, by removing the equipment, and that equipment is Eater of Virtue. This is a legendary equipment. It costs one to cast and one to equip. It gives equip creature plus two plus zero, and whenever equip creature dies, we exile it. And as long as a card exiled with Eater of Virtue has flying, equip creature has flying. And the same is true for first strike, double strike, death touch, haste, hexproof, indestructible, lifelink, menace, protection, reach, trample, and vigilance. Now, the mistake I made with this is thinking that it had synergies with our commanders. It does have synergies with them. Only if we keep the commander exiled. I was under the impression that once the card is exiled, it fulfilled the checking clause here, and then we can return it to the command zone and still have those abilities imbued on Eater of Virtue, which, for the purposes of our two generals, are First Strike, Vigilance, Menace, and Trample. That, those are very, very nice keyword abilities to get stapled onto an equipment that costs one to equip and also comes with a plus two, plus zero power boost. However, that is not the case. We would need to have the creature stay exiled in order to have those keyword abilities attached to Eater of Virtue. And for the purposes of this build, our two commanders, along with our equipment, well, that's our end game. We need to win with them. We can't afford to keep them in exile just for the purposes of building up one of our equipment. So, with that in mind, the Eater of I'm sorry, Eater of Virtue becomes an easy artifact to an easy equipment to replace because it doesn't have the synergies I once mistakenly thought they did. Now we have corrected it. All right, BC, the MTG BC. Those are four equipment going in, four equipment coming out. We have one creature going in and one creature going out. The creature coming into the 98, it is Astor, Bearer of Blades. Here we have a 4-4 four, four Legendary Human Warrior for two in Boros Colors. And when at ETBs, we look at the top seven cards of our library. We may reveal an equipment or vehicle card. It's going to be an equipment because we have no vehicles in this build. We will reveal an equipment card from among them and put it into our hand. We put the rest in the bottom of our library in a random order. With the number of equipment in this build, it's reasonable to think that we should have at least one, probably two. We reveal seven cards. We should reveal on average close to two equipment each time asked or ETBs. Note, it only has to ETB to get that trigger. It doesn't have to attack. It doesn't have to be cast. It just has to enter the battlefield. 
As additional Boni equipment we control have equip cost of one, which is very, very important for us because we want to make sure that we can get as many equipment onto our generals as possible each turn, and we can do so by manipulating their equip costs. It also allows vehicles to be crewed by crew one, but again, there are no vehicles in this build, so we're just going to focus on the equipment part of Astor. Astor is going to put an equipment into our hand or we get, to, we get to pick one of the equipment that we reveal to put into our hand. We're not going to get any more than one. We just may have the options of picking and choosing if more than one show up when we reveal the top seven cards. With Aster going in, in addition to its ability to reduce our equip costs, coming out is a creature that has a similar mana value of four, but it's not two in Boros colors. It's three in a white. It's Armored Sky Hunter. Here's a 3-3 Flying Cat Knight that whenever it attacks, we look at the top six cards of our library. We may put an aura or equipment card from among them onto the battlefield. If it is an equipment, we may attach it to a creature we control, and we may, and then we put the rest on the bottom of our library in a random order. All right, so here's the thought process for Astor going in and Armored Sky Hunter coming out. Astor's ability triggers as soon as it ETBs, we're going to get that equipment into our hand. We may have the ability to cast it right away. We may not. We will have the ability to benefit from equip costs having just one generic mana. That is extremely powerful and rip an, a, a repeatable effect for as long as we have the equipment on our side of the battlefield. For Armored Sky Hunter, it ETBs and then we wait if it doesn't have haste. If it makes it to a round, if it makes it up through a round of turns and we are able to send it into combat, then we get to look at the top six cards of our library, find one of those equipment, put it onto the battlefield, and equip it without paying its equip cost. That is a valuable effect. It's just not fast enough. Astor is going to have a greater impact on the overall game than the Armored Sky Hunter will. It's a bigger creature. It doesn't have evasion, of course. The 3-3 three, three and the flying is a nice pair for the four overall mana. But giving us our equip cost of just one and putting an equipment into our hand when it ETBs, that has a greater impact for the mana investment, and that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to evolve this deck to be a very, very high up-tempo deck. We want things happening every single time we put something into play, and if we're not putting something into play like Astor, then we're most likely using that mana to cast our commanders or to equip our commanders with our equipment so that we can send them into combat at a greater rate making sure that we can do so as efficiently as possible and as powerfully as we can so that we can eliminate each opponent with lethal commander damage. Astor will do a better job of that overall than the Armored Sky Hunter will. Remember, this entire deck is built around our two commanders, our amazing set of equipment, and all of our equipment effects. Astor provides more of an overall equipment synergy than the Armored Sky Hunter does. That's why Astor's going in and the Sky Hunter is coming out. All right, there you have it, MTG BC. We have updated and upgraded our Rograk, Son of Roga, and Akiri Line Slinger, or as I like to refer to them as, our Rograki, our Rogaki deck. And I'm looking forward to hearing your comments about these revisions in the comment section below. This is MTG Burgeoning, your channel for all things magic.